Nationalism is an ideology of expanded, solidified identity. If you are going to build identity, collective identity, on the basis of history, you're going to distort that history. Yeah, you, you are, are actually going for fossils to an extent. Exactly. You are, you are bound to distort that history. You want to glorify it. You want to, you want to underline the silver linings in that history where you are concerned. You want to darken the picture the best you can where the other is concerned. Nationalism is an ideology which always has the other. And therefore, it's a double distortion. You distort by glorifying your own, and you distort by darkening the other's history. Akbal Ahmed, Professor of International Relations and Middle Eastern Studies at Hampshire College, Amherst, Massachusetts, was born in Bihar in India. He was actively involved in the struggle for independence in Algeria with Franz Fanon and the anti-Vietnam War movement in the United States. Akbal Ahmed travels the Grand Trunk Road over a thousand miles from Calcutta to Lahore, a journey he last took as a refugee in 1947 when India was partitioned and he was only 13 years old. Lazily afloat on time's stream, my mind turns to the sky. As I cross its empty expanses, shadowy pictures form in my eyes of the many ages of the long past and the many peoples that have hurtled forward confident of victory. The Patans came greedy for empire, and the Mughals brandishing victory banners, the wheels of their conquering chariots raising webs of dust. I look at the sky, no sign of them now, today. Through the ages, the light of sunrise and sunset continues to redden the sky's pure blue at dawn and dusk. Then others came along tracks of iron and fire-breathing vehicles, the mighty British scattering their power beneath the same sky. I know that time will flow along their road too, float off somewhere, the land encircling web of their empire. I know their merchandise-bearing soldiers will not make the slightest impression on planetary paths. But people work. Over the ruins of hundreds of empires, the people work. Our story begins here in Calcutta, the first capital of the Raj. Bengal was the crucible of opposition to the British the home of radicals and poets, many of whom had ironically been educated in Britain. It also became the focus of another opposition, the conflict between Hindu and Muslim nationalism that still bedevils the subcontinent today. Calcutta was for us our glory, our present, and also our future. It became the first capital of the British in India. See, nationalism, especially in our part of the world, developed in response to colonialism. The white man came here claiming that he was going to carry the brown man's burden. So there was already the notion the white man was different from the brown man. The brown man, in his reaction, developed his own nationalism, which said the brown man is different from the white man, and he is as good, if not better. So sometimes you would say it's better because we have had a longer civilization. We go back 4,000 years uh, while we were 
creating our great epics. Englishmen were sitting in caves and so on and so forth. All sorts of historical truths and untruths are mixed. Then you organize collective emotion on the basis of difference. It is going to promote extremes and hatreds. At the heart of anti-colonial Calcutta was a man with a different vision. Knighted by the British and awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, Rabindranath Tagore was India's greatest contemporary poet and a most far-sighted humanist. He opposed colonial rule, not because it was British, but because it was discriminatory and oppressive, and dreamed of a tolerant, universalist India, glorying in its matchless diversity, its many ethnicities and some 850 languages. A free India would serve as a model quite different from the modern nation states like Britain, Germany or France. He saw World War I as an ultimate expression of all that was dangerous about nationalism and the nation states of Europe and Japan. As a child, it must have been 1940, during the Quit India movement, some members of my family were arrested and interned in Calcutta. I went there and uh, my family made its usual, shall I say, pilgrimage to Rabindranath Tagore. He was an old man then. I remember him lying in bed. He was not walking around when we visited him. And it was just about a year, year and a half later that Robert Harcourt died. He was a great man, honored, but also looked askance in the nationalist circles. not against one nation in particular, but against the general idea of all nations. What is the nation? It is the aspect of a whole people as an organized power. This organization incessantly keeps up the insistence of the population on becoming strong and efficient. But this strenuous effort after strength and efficiency drains man's energy from his highest nature, where he is self-sacrificing and creative. For thereby, man's power of sacrifice is diverted from his ultimate object, which is moral, to the maintenance of this organization, which is mechanical. By this device, the people which loves freedom perpetuates slavery in a large portion of the world with a comfortable feeling of pride in having done its duty. Men who are naturally just can be cruelly unjust, both in their act and their thought. The nation, with all its paraphernalia of power and prosperity, its flags and pious hymns, its blasphemous prayers in the churches, and the literary mock thunders of its patriotic bragging, cannot hide the fact that the nation is the greatest evil to itself. He warned the world, and he warned India, that if it takes to the ideology of difference, Today we are differentiating between the colonizers and the colonized. Tomorrow we will differentiate between the Hindus and the Muslims. And the day after tomorrow, perhaps between Sikhs and Hindus. And yet day after tomorrow, perhaps between the South and the North. There is no end to ideologies of difference. And he argued India's genius lies 
in its heterogeneity, in its pluralism, in its ability to accommodate all. It's a rainbow civilization. He was prophetic. He has turned out to be right. As it passes Howrah Bridge, the Grand Trunk Road gets very busy. The statue of Rajiv Gandhi, himself assassinated by Tamil nationalists, points its way to Delhi from Bengal. Tagore died in 1941. Six years later, Britain quit India, transferring power to two nation states, India and Pakistan. Ironically, independent India took a Tagore song as its national anthem. In 1972, the irony was compounded when Bangladesh, after breaking away from Pakistan, adopted another Tagore song as its national anthem. Why not? Symbols of nationalism rarely conform to historical realities. Trunk Road was built by the Emperor Sher Shah Suri in the 16th century. His regime briefly interrupted the reign of the Mughals, who ruled much of the subcontinent until the mid 19th century. Both Sher Shah and the Mughals were Muslims. Muslim and Hindus lived side by side, one dominant politically, the other numerically and economically. Mughals were energetic rulers, building great monuments and palaces, notably the Taj Mahal, and instituting an all-pervading, ordered state largely administered by Hindus of the upper castes. I'm in front of the tomb of Sher Shah Suri, the builder of the Grand Trunk Road. I used to live across the street from the tomb in a very old and historic house which has been, it appears, destroyed. Early in the 16th century, Sher Shah Suri, who drove out the second Mughal emperor Humayun from his throne, conceived of this road and said, the roads are the carriers of civilization, the insurer of empire and facilitator of commerce. That road is in a state of neglect, as is the tomb we are facing. The artificial lake in the middle of which it is set serves today as the washroom of the entire town. I am here at last. We are on a country road that leads to my ancestral village. These rice fields of iridescent green are so vivid in my memory. One picture of childhood that seems unaltered and timeless amidst the enormous changes in this country and in my life. I haven't seen Irki, the village of my birth, since the day I said goodbye to my mother in 1947, I was 13 years old.
آپ مزے میں آپ کچھ کیسا نہ کہو آپ کا جی اب یہ سلسلہ ہے کہ پہلے کچھ ہوگا میرا خیال تھا میں گھر کی طرف نہ چلوں I was pointing out these to you, this whole block. On the left side of the street, as you approach the village, they were mostly Hindu homes. We, we had a tradition of living more or less side by side. This is almost literally true. The old custom was that when the Muslims came in for the Eid prayers, our Hindu friends waited for the end of the prayer to embrace each other. I am seeking permission to go into my house. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be, where there is now sort of mud wall, there used to be a small kitchen. And that's what we used as the Hindu kitchen of the family house. Walls, of course, have been drawn around. That wall is, divides the house. Because many <laughs> different families are living here. And that pro mushil hogi. Ji khula to hoga. Ji. So it has been partitioned several ways. But now you have electricity, no? Yeah, electricity. Bijli a gaya. It has changed in ways that I find very hard to relate to it. There was right here, in this relatively large courtyard, uh, right there, there was a very beautiful well on which we drew waters and lots of peasant women came and worked here. Lots of them worked also in that corner of the house. Hmm. Well, the well in this case is intact. In the other house, it has been replaced with a pump. And there are no partitions of this portion, at least. Pani kya nikalna? Pani nikal ke dekho to kaisa? Dekho. Pani saaf hai? Pine pine ke laak hai? Nikal. Gilas kya yaar lagao? Lagao na. Yaan se lagao. پانی بہت میٹھا ہے آپ لوگوں کا ابھی تک ایسے ہی میٹھا ہے جیسا پہلے تو اور دو اس جنٹلمن تھوٹ اے سوڈس منشپ اینڈ گرف کا دے یوز آف سوڈس اینڈ سو آن اینڈ ہی واز ون آف دا فائنسٹ ان دیٹ ٹریڈ اینڈ آئی جسٹ آسک ہیم اف یو ووڈ گیو می دا فسٹ ون اور ٹو Movements. Wow. This was my home fifty years ago. People here are so warm and obviously hold fond memories of my family. But it is a painful encounter, for it was here that I was to have my first experience of the havoc that nationalism can bring. This is the spot which used to be open. It was a veranda. This is where my father was killed in 1937. I was three and a half years old. I slept, was with him at the time. He protected me, so I survived. He didn't. 
it was a combination of nationalist politics and the questions of land. That's all. I cried out probably and called out people. This. My father's tomb was somewhere here. I cannot exactly identify this spot anymore. Uh, most of the tombs, one tomb and the graves are gone. And this is the relatively new grave of my uncle and his wife. Where are they gone is a matter both of pain and pleasure to me personally. If you look at the, the village beyond, you would notice that that village, unlike most of the peasant homes here, is built of bricks. So the dead are giving some life to the living. Let's pray here. Yeah? On the 3rd of June, 1947, I uh, obtained the consent of the leaders of Congress, the Muslims and the Sikhs, to the plan by which two new independent nations were to be created. And incidentally, which gave new life and scope to the concept of the British Commonwealth. Mountbatten's fateful decision triggered off a great upheaval in the tinderbox of rival nationalisms. Hundreds of thousands died in communal carnage. Millions of frightened people fled their homes. Ten million Muslims headed for the areas that were to become Pakistan, while millions of Hindus and Sikhs moved the other way. I remember that that evening we all broadcast over All India Radio. Mr. Jinnah, Baldev Singh, the Sikh leader, Nehru, and myself. And I shall never forget one of the sentences which Nehru used on that occasion. He said, we are small men serving a great cause, but because the cause is great, something of that greatness falls upon us also. Leaders of the Congress, and especially Jawaharlal Nehru, lost the great opportunity to save India's unity when they rejected the option of a decentralized federal structure. Secondly, thousands, perhaps a million lives, might have been saved had Lord Mountbatten not hastened the partition of India and the transfer of power. Like my father, mother was a Congress supporter. In 1946, religious riots broke out in Bihar. Mahatma Gandhi toured the riot-torn villages, taking with him Muslim and Hindu children to symbolize unity in our common humanity. I was one of the boys. But my eldest brother, including Zafar, with whom I lived, were Muslim League sympathizers. They decided to leave for Pakistan. Mother refused to leave. Years later, John Berger remarked that only mothers who are widows can become as immovable as she did. We traveled along the Grand Trunk Road, passing through Allahabad, Pandit Nehru's hometown, and reached Delhi safely. 
There, at a stroke, we became refugees. Young Indians, Gandhi, Jinnah, and scores of others went to England for education. There, they were our first converts. They swallowed the doctrine of national will, national pride, national superiority, and above all, national self-determination. They successfully used that doctrine to derive the British out of India. They believed that once India was free, the road to prosperity, equality, fraternity will be opened. We are driving around in New Delhi, the capital that was built by the Raj in India, the English-speaking leadership, including the children of the old nationalist leaders, live in these enclaves of privileges. So that an apartheid of sorts had sharp. It's indistinguishable. It could be Islamabad. Uh, Tree-lined streets, nice, colonial and some modern houses. Uh, the new capital of Pakistan, Islamabad, is totally separate from the rest of the country. Uh, so much so that the going joke in Islamabad is that it's a wonderful city because it is only 10 minutes away from Pakistan. provided refuge to Muslims who were fleeing the violence that occurred at the time of partition in 1947. The builder of the Grand Trunk Road, Sher Shah Suri, had a lot to do with its construction also. I was one of the refugees' children inside. I have many memories attached to this place almost every inch of it. <laughs> Conditions were very harsh, uh, but children managed to play. There was only one well, and there was a great shortage of water. Uh, twice, Pandit Nehru came personally and talked to the refugees. The most profound memory, it's a longish story, is that of the opium meter named Abdul Ghafoor. He was bent over and for the first two, three days whining constantly for opium, which he didn't have. And we used to make fun of him. As we started out towards Pakistan, and went through lots of difficulty. People were killed, some died of cholera, etc., etc. The opium eater kept straightening up. And by the seventh day, he was leading the caravan. The day of our fateful march to Pakistan, we gathered at another of Delhi's landmarks, the Red Fort, also built by the Mughals. This is the Lahore Gate. I am here because this is where the caravan of refugees gathered. In Delhi, I got separated from the rest of my family. 
and trudged along amidst the strangers. I do not remember worrying about my family. We were on the road a month, raided twice, beset by disease, hunger, and above all, fear and fatigue. This is how the border looked when we came. It was full of multitudes of people on both sides of the Grand Trunk Road. Men, women, children, some going this way, some going towards Lahore. It was a mass migration both ways. And when the people came in at the border, which we just saw, they were filled with emotions. They had lost children. Lots of children died. <clears throat> Men and women fell on the ground, kissed the ground, as if they didn't die. As if all the deaths, all the bloodshed, had been compensated for by the recovery of this home. There was a great deal of suffering and there was that brief moment when they had forgotten it to celebrate the creation of a new nation state. I suppose the same was true of the refugees, Hindus and Sikhs that were going to India. They must have crossed there, so I don't see. And somewhere over there, it was a very empty land in those days, hardly any mechanized traffic passed. And somewhere later on, two, three miles down, I had found with a group of people a taxi that took us to Lahore. That was the first land transport I had taken in nearly 300 miles. We have just left the border at Vaga where India-Pakistan divide, the Grand Trunk Road is divided, is broken. We are heading towards Lahore, and it is quite extraordinary, it's a wonderful feeling in a way, that the subcontinent has divided, and yet somehow, one thing that does seem to pull it together is the Grand Trunk Road, ironically. The old Sher Shah must be happy today, huh? So it's this part of the Grand Trunk Road is the subject of Kipling's books. The travels that Kim does, for example, is more in the north and northwest part of India. 
because he himself lived in Lahore. See, Holy One, the great road which is the backbone of all Hind. In the days before rail carriages, the sahibs travelled up and down here in hundreds. Now there are only country carts and such like. Look, Brahmins and Chamas, bankers and tinkers, barbers and banyas, pilgrims and potters, all the world going and coming. It is to me as a river from which I am withdrawn like a log after a flood. And truly, the Grand Trunk Road is a wonderful spectacle. It runs straight, bearing without crowding India's traffic for 1,500 miles, such a river of life as nowhere else exists in the world. People are moving from the countryside into the city, and right there, smack in the cities, they have lost their old identity. They're moving out because the land cannot support a growing population. New identity is not available for them. Most of the time, labor unions are not very strong. It's much easier for them to search, look for certainties that they had known, identities they had known. And when a new political party seems to promise that, a new political movement seems to promise that. Come to our fold, this is Islam. Come to our fold, this is Hindutva. Comes to our fold, this is Judaism. They follow. Right here is the monument to Queen Victoria, built somewhere around 1910. Uh, you will notice that this is very much made in the style of Mughal architecture. It's a Mughal arches, the, the stonework also very Mughal. And in the middle of it, there was a statue of Queen Victoria. After independence, what we have done is to remove the statue and in place of it, we have put a replica of the Holy Quran. So what has happened is that the substance has remained the same and the symbols have been changed. We are now going to visit my friend Radha Kazim. He is a lawyer of international fame has been opposed to military regimes in Pakistan and for his pains has been in prison several times. The last time during Muhammad Ziaul Haq, he was almost executed and became a cause celebre internationally. I was uh, dramatically disappointed um, within a few months of my coming to Pakistan. Um, Perhaps the mistake lay in my expectations, in my youthful expectations, innocent uh, expectations that Pakistan would mean not only just uh, political freedom from the British, but uh, also um, a beautiful application of that freedom in the transformation of our lives. Um, in human and material terms. Jinnah is Governor General. He takes the oath of allegiance to King George VI as head of Pakistan. Faz wrote Dag Dag Ujala Yeshab Guzida Sahar, the morning of freedom. Yes. Uh, soon after Pakistan had been created, the first anniversary. Yes, yes. And you knew him? Yes, sir. I, we got to know each other since 48. And we, um, uh, he was 20 years older to me, but uh, um, we instantly became uh, soul brothers. Faz Ahmad Faz wrote poignantly of nationalism and of its ironies and tragedies. Today, millions throughout the divided subcontinent recite his poems by heart. <laughs> Ye daag daag ujala ye shab kazida sahar 
वो इंतजार था जिसका ये वो शहर तो नहीं ये वो शहर तो नहीं जिसकी आरजू लेकर चले थे यार के मिल जाएगी कहीं न कहीं पलक के दश्त में तारों की आखिरी मंजिल पलक के दश्त में तारों की आखिरी मंजिल कहीं तो होगा शबे सुस्त मौज का साहिल कहीं तो जाके रुकेगा सफीना हमें दिल अभी गरानी शब में कमी नहीं आई निजात दीदा और दिल की घड़ी नहीं आई चले चलो कि वो मंजिल अभी नहीं फैज वॉज एज यू पैप्स नो ऑल्सो इन द ट्रेड यूनियन मूवमेंट ही वर्क विद अस इन द पाकिस्तान ट्रेड यूनियन फेडरेशन इन द रेलवे वर्कर्स फेडरेशन we were both equally disillusioned he on a mature level and i on an adolescent level because of what we had witnessed in the early days of pakistan the environment as far as we were concerned it was clear it had chosen to preserve the colonial culture the colonial values and the colonial forms and we also knew that without the british uh our attempts to continue british colonialism was bound to make it much worse which is in fact what we succeeded in doing we knew it would become far more lawless far more arbitrary than even the british rule was perversity mm-hmm. is the word i can use to describe our last 50 years social perversity personal perversity mm-hmm. cultural perversity mm-hmm. we are not a barbaric people we are not a backward people inherently we have chosen to be perverse in these decades and i am willing to grant it to my people if they so choose but i know they will not get away with it oh i have not the slightest doubt about the future the worse it gets the more convinced i am of the future um the only thing is that uh, it's been a long time since i have um uh, got over the uh, youthful desire to see the future myself and to be a part of it that is no longer a desire but a desire to be a part of the making of it i am looking from the lahore fort at the complex of the mosque and next to it the temple the mosque was built in the 17th century by the mogal emperor shah jahan the temple built by raja ranjit singh a ruler in the punjab came later but the worshippers would go come and be respected in each community today that situation has changed in the last 10 years alone three major monuments of sikhs and muslims have been destroyed either by the action of the state or by religious fundamentalists some young men got into the mosque itself they raised the saffron flag they started destroying the structure the police did nothing to prevent them the smoke marks the site where one of kashmir's patron saints has been revered for 600 years there was little that fire engines could do as a gun battle continued all day By carrying the fight right into the Sikh holy shrines, the Indian government will be automatically condemned by the prosperous and sensitive Sikh community. As modernization has proceeded, market has invaded, uh, spaces have been shrunk, uh, communities have been boxed in with each other, say in city spaces. Uh, people have tended to assert an older or imagined alternatives and especially in this situation political parties have moved in uh, hindu militancy has moved in muslim fundamentalist parties have moved in uh, these these parties are making appeals to a very glorified uh, imagined tradition Today, at the end of the 20th century, 
when we've seen the birth and the growth and the gradual development of these movements, uh, every country that is constituted in the area of South Asia is in fact in the grip of what I would call not just religious nationalism, but it has a fascistic element. And the fascistic element, it seems to me, is that in each of these ideologies of religious nationalism, the basic argument is that the majority of the people that identify with a particular religion, whether it is Hinduism or Islam or Buddhism or whatever it may be, constitute the majority in a democratic sense. And therefore, they have the right to determine uh, what society should do, what the state should do, how people should be governed and so on. Uh, this, it seems to me, is really fascistic nationalism. It throws out the whole notion it, of a secular state. It throws out the whole notion of a secular state. It throws out the equal participation of those who do not identify with the majority religious group in that particular country. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history, when we step out from the old to the new, when an age ends, and when the soul of a nation, long suppressed, finds utterance. of Mahatma Gandhi's Samadhi, right on the banks of the Yamuna River. Gandhi was cremated here after his assassination on January 30th, 1948, barely four and a half months after independence. Friends and comrades, the light has gone out of our lives, and there is darkness everywhere. And I do not quite know what to tell you and how to say it. Our beloved leader, Bapu as we called him, the father of the nation, is no more. Indian extremism has not been kind to its leaders nor has been that of Pakistan or Bangladesh. Gandhi was murdered, the founding father of India, by a Hindu extremist. Uh, Mrs. Indra Gandhi was murdered by two Sikhs, taking revenge for the state's invasion of the Golden Temple. Rajiv Gandhi was murdered later by a Tamil extremist. In Pakistan, Liaquat Ali Khan, the founding father, was ma murdered in 1952. In Bangladesh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, Bangladesh's fine founding father, was also murdered. So South Asian extremism has not been kind to its founding fathers. At the same time, the state has not been terribly kind to its people. There is a fixation with force that is almost overwhelming. Just as we were walking into Mahatma Gandhi's Samadhi, we found the place surrounded by men in arms and uniform, as if the apostle of non-violence has been taken over by armed men. Why have those hopes of the Founding Fathers been disappointed? Well, they have not been realized for the several reasons. Firstly, 
doctrine of nationalism was a doctrine of industrialized imperial nations. Mm -hmm. We were not industrialized, we were an agricultural country. And we didn't have the wherewithal to be imperial. Secondly, it uh, made us fight bitterly among ourselves. More than a million have been killed, mm -hmm. tens of millions have migrated. Fight was waged for India's independence. Muslims said that they were a different nation. They got Pakistan. Then Bengalis said that although they were Muslims, but they were a different nation. They got Bangladesh. Now in Bangladesh, Chakma, Chakmas are laying claim to a nationhood. Now where does one stop? There is no end to national struggles. Mm -hmm. So, does it mean, Dr. Shah, that we should turn our back on this newfound ideology? Oh, most, most certainly, mo most certainly, because it is an inhuman doctrine. It divides people rather than unites. Mm -hmm. It inculcates religious, ethnic, linguistic hatred. Mm -hmm. It unites the exploiters and exploited, mm -hmm. to fight exploiters and ex united exploiters and exploited of other nations. Yeah. And thus it prevents social change. It has brought disaster to South Asia. In Karachi, Pakistan's largest city, a virtual civil war is raging between the government and the Urdu-speaking people who migrated from India, including my part of Bihar. There are daily reports of terrorist attacks, mass arrests, torture, and murders in government custody. Ironic indeed, for at war with the state are the children of die-hard Pakistan nationalists, whose migration to Karachi 50 years ago had invested symbolic meaning in the new state. Then. They were called Muhajirs, in reference to Prophet Muhammad's epoch-making migration from Mecca to Medina. As in India, in Pakistan, the state is at war with people protesting their oppression and neglect, often behind the banner of ethnic nationalism. <laughs> 